So, yes, uh, Lars already pre presented me. Uh, I'll just briefly um, uh, mention a little bit about my background. I I'm a former historian in Sweden. And I also lectured in, for example, intelligence studies and other uh, topics. Nowadays, I'm a researcher and educator in uh, dig digital literacy, media and information literacy, digital critical thinking and and the like uh, as a consultant for a small company called um, Alefonti. Uh, and here we also have the, um, the name of my session, Fake News, Disinformation, Media Literacy, Propaganda. Um, a little something first about this Facebook group that's uh, become quite well known in, in Sweden uh, and in partly in some other Scandinavian countries uh, as well. Uh, its name is in Swedish Kjellkritik, Fake News and Faktagranskning. Um, uh, Kjellkritik is a Swedish and Scandinavian word for uh, uh, what you in English could call source criticism. Uh, source criticism is not a strong concept uh, in English, uh, but in the Scandinavian languages, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it has a strong role in uh, academic society and so on uh, regarding uh, um, being critical towards uh, sources, analyze and evaluate uh, sources. It comes from the history. Uh, field uh, originally. And nowadays, when you talk about uh, critically uh, analyzing and evaluating what you see in, uh, in the digital world, you use this word um, uh, source criticism uh, in the Scandinavian languages. So there, there's a little uh, language, um, um, not problem, but we call things a little bit different <laughs> with different words in different languages. Uh, this group uh, has been ongoing for soon um, four years. I'm the main administrator and I have three moderators that helps me. And much of the work with the group is a spin-off from uh, my consultant work in education and research at uh, Elefanti. And today we are almost 19,000 members. Uh, originally the, the, the focus groups uh, with, uh, plan to be like uh, uh, teachers, librarians, journalists, scholars, etc. But there has also been a strong interest from uh, a, wi a wider, uh, broader public, um, and they're welcome as well. And we have had quite a high tempo in, in the group uh, during these uh, barely four years. We've had uh, 13,000 posts, uh, uh, much of research, and at a uh, debate topics and so on. Um, uh, so there's a lot of information uh, being uh, gathered there. Uh, a little about the, some challenges and the, some changes with, with this group over time. Um, it was, uh, we thought of it as an experiment, experiment from the beginning. Uh, one idea was to create a forum, uh, a national forum for discussion about the topics of, you know, uh, the fake news concept, which was uh, much debated for three, four years ago. Uh, digital literacy, source criticism, uh, media critique and media literacy, and so on, with a focus on the digital uh, world, uh, the new challenges. Um, and much of it has been a spin-off, uh, as I said, from my own monitoring of, of these topics. I'm a little bit inspired by uh, scientist Twitter or scholar Twitter, where people uh, often very generously share uh, what they read and uh, think about uh, in their networks. Uh, and it's been very much my own, to a large part, been my own public notebook. I do uh, a majority of the posts uh, in it. Um, one goal was to connect different networks of stakeholders uh, working around these issues, um, stakeholders and professionals. Um, uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been much professional discussions. It's not that teachers uh, discuss um, uh, topics of education uh, or pedagogics and so on in the group. Where we 
and therefore we have started uh, one new more specialized group for, for teachers and pedagogues um, uh, called MIL in school, Media and Information Literacy in school. Um, because it's so much information, so much research, so much uh, yeah, different things <laughs> passing by in the group, uh, early on one thought uh, became that we should use the group as a bank, uh, that we collect knowledge and uh, learning resources there. Uh, but one challenge is uh, how you do that in a Facebook group, you know, a, a group with a constant flu flow of, of uh, uh, new content. And another problem is that posts have very different reach. Some posts don't reach many members at all. Others reach uh, very many people. Um, so it's a little um, difficult to maneuver uh, this kind of uh, construction. Uh, one problem that evolved was that when the group was quite small, uh, uh, it was very interesting to uh, work practically around the issue of fact checking, analyze problematic material and so on. Um, uh, but it became more difficult when the group uh, grew. Um, it was more challenging to moderate. Uh, so one um, a conclusion we made after a while was that uh, this is a, a method, crowdsourcing uh, work uh, concretely with um, uh, fact checking and, uh, and digital uh, evaluation and so on. It works well in small groups with clear rules and careful moderation uh, because there are many people with uh, interesting uh, expertise uh, out there, um, but with a large group that becomes very difficult. Um, and also with a large group, there follows greater ethical responsibility uh, for what is shared. You have to more and more think like a, uh, a real publisher uh, in this environment. Uh, different content meets very different engagement. Uh, current events, concrete examples, they engage much more than uh, our primary focus, uh, you know, the more meta uh, uh, content of guides and tools and, and learning resources and studies and so on. Uh, so you can see this uh, tendency of uh, content that is more or less uh, triggering, um, uh, is more popular, but it also necessitates uh, moderation in uh, a different way. So the group in itself illustrates some problems uh, uh, with social media uh, and perhaps with ourselves, how we people behave <laughs> on social media. Um, it has also become more difficult to use Facebook when discussing some of our topics. Uh, many uh, problematic links, pictures, words, hashtags, and so on, uh, they can be deleted by Facebook. Uh, for example, when their own fact checkers have reacted to something. Uh, and this has become an increasing problem. So the group has been forced to increasingly uh, focus on a legit legitimate meta content and uh, uh, therefore also. Um, uh, diminish our work directly with problematic uh, material. Uh, and there are a few examples of the main uh, topics, the main uh, themes uh, uh, in the group, what we often call for source criticism, criticism 2.0. Uh, um, of course, media information literacy and critical thinking, uh, an analytic model we often use is uh, the one called information disorder from uh, the Institute First Drafts, which is used quite a lot nowadays uh, in this field. Uh, the fake news concept, uh, digital literacy, uh, overall the challenges of navigating uh, digital uh, media landscape, the propaganda concept, the challenges from a world uh, to a large degree um, led by algorithms, the phenomenon of astroturfing, the problems around hate, online extremism, toxic content, conspiracy theories, media ethics, as I mentioned, and different kind of cognitive biases, the, the, the human um, um, part of some of the problems. Um, the picture is from a, a presentation of the group in the group uh, for the members. Uh, one way of uh, 
solving the problem of, uh, of gathering at least some of, of the uh, material in the group more systematically is uh, that Facebook has a function called guidelines uh, where you can uh, uh, structure some of the old uh, posts thematically in different maps. And here are the 20 maps or, or guides we have now where some of the earlier uh, posts are, are uh, structured thematically in, in 20 different um, um, areas. And uh, I don't have to read them, but you see a little about how, how different issues are uh, given themes. Uh, the problem of science versus pseudoscience and conspiracy theories. Uh, memes and image analysis, polarization, post-truth, tools, resources, um, journalism, alternative media, hate, toxic content, etc. Why do you fall for uh, the, the cognitive or psychological um, um, uh, way of uh, discussing these problems? Uh, and so on. We have a, a few newer, uh, in 2020, we, of course, we had to start up one guide with the topic of coronavirus, and recently also one about the vaccine, because they have become uh, very big uh, thematic ch challenges during the pandemic. Uh, when I and many others in this field discuss the, the challenges of today, we, we often start with the feed, uh, the flow of information, uh, most of all in, in different types of social media. And that somehow, to start there, you, you can um, uh, point out some of the foundational uh, problems and, and uh, uh, challenges. Um, with the feed, uh, the information comes to you. There's a push factor rather than pull. Uh, and your attention is constantly targeted. And there's, for many people, also an, a tendency to information overload. You have very much information and you uh, don't always have the time or the energy to evaluate and, and sort it uh, in different ways. Uh, and what characterizes the feed uh, contrary to when you, for example, go into a library, uh, is that the different types of information are equated simultaneously in the feed and in the distribution. You have everything mixed all together. Traditional news, popular culture, bloggers, jokes, advertising, clickbaits, um, propaganda, per more personal conversations, culture wars, and so on and so on. Uh, and in this world, therefore, uh, the news media's traditional gatekeeper function uh, in public conversation has uh, almost uh, been abolished. So there's a new responsibility um, uh, put on the individual media consumer uh, or media user. Uh, and much of the focus must be on uh, the ability of identifying uh, different types of information in this feed how the information is used, how it's disseminated, what drives and amplifi amplifies, and the motives or intentions that my, may uh, lie behind uh, this. Uh, some central uh, concepts is down in the bottom there. Motive, intention, cognitive factors, why do I react as I do? Uh, algorithms, uh, possible manipulation, and so on. Um, you could say that in this new digital world, um, everyone more or less becomes uh, three things. Uh, a journalist, uh, we must all uh, assess and examine sources critically. At the same time, we have to reflect on ourselves, our reactions uh, in a new way. And here are uh, quite a few um, uh, capacities or abilities uh, that uh, we must reflect over and perhaps train uh, each other uh, or ourselves uh, in. I mentioned them, most of them earlier, digital literacy and so on. Source trust is a quite new concept. Uh, that is uh, the ability of identifying uh, the trustworthy material. Where do you find the trustworthy sources? 
because there are so much different sources to choose from. Search literacy, know how to search information. Uh, information literacy, science literacy, some um, principal ideas about how science works. Uh, and social and emotional literacy is a quite new concept. Um, uh, the reflexivity of uh, uh, not least how you self act and react um, uh, in these environments. We're also becoming publishers or editors. Um, every, everything we write and share is information that affects other people. And we have to reflect what is important to write about and share. What, what is news value and newsworthy? Uh, classical questions for publishers, but now it's a little, little, little bit a topic for everyone. And reflect on ethical and also legal uh, boundaries and media ethical uh, approach. Uh, and here things um, cooperate. I mean, uh, some knowledge or literacy about how media works and uh, how news media works. That's something you can apply uh, to, to yourself as well uh, as uh, a user uh, in uh, uh, social media. Uh, I often also, also add that we're, we're all, as soon as we enter uh, social media, we are propagandists. Uh, because everything we do in social media, sharing, liking, commenting, it's an intervention uh, towards other people in this sphere. You could call it a semi-public sphere. Uh, it affects directly people, but it also uh, affects their feeds uh, uh, via the, the, the algorithms and click statistics, uh, etc. Uh, and all these actions from you are at the same time coveted uh, by other actors. There, there are so many who, who want you to react and act and click and um, in different ways in social media for different reasons. Uh, with different intents uh, behind. Um, okay, how, how shall we deal with this uh, when we try to pre present these problems for uh, the public? Uh, how should schools uh, work with these issues and so on? And there are different kinds of um, learning resources and materials. Here's uh, one quite a simple but quite good uh, example of uh, a version of how you can uh, make a typology of uh, misleading news, um, so-called fake news. Um, this one is from uh, EAVI, uh, it's a media consumer organization in, in uh, uh, Europe. Um, and it's, it's uh, quite a good um, Typology: uh, ten different um, types of misinformation that you can elaborate on and discuss, for example, in a, in a classroom or something like that. Uh, they have different scales they use. Uh, uh, how how toxic or problematic is it? Which kind of impact does it have? What what may the uh, uh, motivation behind be for these different sorts? And there is propaganda, clickbait, sponsored content, uh, etc. It's just an example. There, there are many of uh, this kind of resources. Uh, I, this is one of the better, uh, I would say. This one is uh, uh, translated to uh, nowadays uh, 17 languages in uh, in EU. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier the model of information disorder from first of the night. I have a few, a couple of pictures here. We don't have to delve into it, but I'll, I'll briefly mention some um, uh, important categories in this model that are uh, useful often when you think about and talk about uh, misinformation and different types and let's say uh, the mechanisms uh, within and around digital uh, misinformation. Here you have a, a partition in three parts from the two categories of falseness and intent to harm. Uh, so they put the word misinformation, it's a type, it's a type for uh, more or less unintentional mistakes. It's false, but it's not um, uh, particularly harmful. 
it's, it has not the, uh, the intent of harm. In the middle, you have uh, the disinformation, which is bo both false often and has some kind of intent to harm uh, deliberately. And to the right, you have malinformation, uh, which is not false. It's correct information, uh, but it can be, for example, very private uh, data or information that's not suitable to uh, spread uh, in public. Um, and all these three can uh, vary together and uh, uh, be woven, uh, woven to together in different forms uh, uh, in, for example, social media. Uh, one important point this model um, points out is, is that uh, uh, message and um, the message can a change character over time, for example, in the social media. Uh, the message is created, it's then reproduced when it's turned into some kind of media product and then distributed. But it can be reproduced again in a new frame uh, when it's shared, for example. Uh, and then suddenly perhaps something uh, correct and non-problematic can be problematic. It's an old news, for example, in a new context. It, it takes on a new character. And here's a, a picture where the first draft uh, uh, gives a concrete example. Of, uh, it was the news um, uh, during the um, American election 20, 2016 when someone claimed that the Pope Francis uh, endorsed Donald Trump for president. Someone mentioned it on social media somewhere. It was turned into a, a media claim by some less serious uh, media uh, actors. Then it was shared on Facebook uh, and other places. Then it was reshared by different groups uh, of people. There were those connected to this more or less fake news network. But there were also tr uh, the Trump supporters that liked this news and shared it. It was shared by uh, Hillary Clinton supporters who shared it to show how stupid Trump supporters are and so on and so on. There can be different motives when information is redistributed over and over again. They also have other um, ways of going into the different stages. Here are different questions you can put to uh, the agent, to the actual message and to the interpreter receiver who then perhaps uh, goes in again and uh, reshares and builds a new narrative and so on. Um, we don't have to go into it, but uh, it, it, I would say this is a very good model to use if you have some time to discuss the, these information problems. It's used, for example, in uh, Finnish uh, education nowadays, and it's used very much in uh, international organizations. Um, they try to um, analyze uh, these uh, mechanisms. There are also some um, not very uh, quite good new methods, um, skills uh, that are brought forth uh, as um, for, for educational purposes. Um, one method is called lateral reading. Uh, it's been elaborated for some years by uh, um, a group in Stanford uh, at Stanford University and uh, by one uh, very well known uh, pedagogue in these uh, matters, Michael Caulfield. Um, the idea is that uh, everyone should learn to work a little bit like a fact checker. Uh, and this is a, a method uh, that can be applied and trained in most school subjects, uh, for example. Uh, the picture is from a study uh, this year that showed that uh, when you work with this, you get very good results. Um, uh, regarding source criticism and a critical uh, standing uh, approach to uh, digital uh, information. Uh, we don't have to go into details, but here's the overall uh, idea of, of lateral reading. It's in four stages. The important point is to don't um, get stuck in the 
problematic place in the problematic site or article or whatever it is move on to other places search for uh, completing information in other places that's the the, the fundament, fundamental idea and this is something many people do but perhaps not uh, are training themselves uh, structurally uh, in and this is something you, you can do you can, you can elaborate this uh, in different ways um, so check for previous work um, go upstream to the sources, read laterally, search about the source, and uh, circle back. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a procedure, a workflow, you could say. Uh, it's one picture more about the same. Uh, if we go back 5, 10, 15 years, there were a lot of these checklists. You should, if there's something you think, think believe is problematic or feel hesitant about a claim, uh, you have these lists with the questions you should put uh, to the source. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, purpose, crap is the acronym for this model. Uh, and these guides or checklists have been long, uh, they became longer and longer with many, many questions, and no one had the energy or, or to learn all these, to sit with these long lists. And it's all a matter of just this lateral reading, as um, uh, Sam Weinberg uh, is commenting uh, in the top of the, of the picture. Buried in these 15 questions is, can you verify the information in another source? It's the only question that matters. Uh, to try to find uh, the simple approaches. Uh, there is good material in English um, and learning resources around this and how we can train uh, lateral reading. Uh, there's a fine video series called uh, uh, Crash Course, uh, Crash Course uh, Navigating Digital Information and, and part number three is about lateral reading. Uh, I recommend that uh, series of videos overall. It's, it's very good. It's from media wise and, and crash course um yeah i could also mention uh, unesco has an old curriculum uh, regarding media and information literacy from 2011 and it's well many has thought that it's getting a bit old the challenges that there have been the discussions have been uh, deepened, new problems uh, has been detected and so on. And now just a few weeks ago, they, they came with a new curriculum, um, uh, Think Critically, Click Wisely. Um, unfortunately, they withdrew that uh, almost immediately uh, for some revisions. So this is preliminary, but, but it, will, it will be public again uh, soon, uh, I hope. And they have a, a, a few new models, especially module number one, uh, uh, nine, sorry, um, is about media and information literacy competences uh, to tackle disinformation and hate speech. Uh, and uh, as far as I looked at it, it looked really good. There are a lot of good tips for educators, not least for uh, adult um, uh, pupils or students. Um, here are some of the key words in that module. Um, truth, the disinformation ecosystem, media and disinformation, impacts of disinformation, and the literacy uh, concept. Um, but uh, as I said, yeah, they withdrew it, so in, probably in a few weeks it will be back. And uh, it looks re really interesting, actually. Uh, now to the more concrete challenges now. Um, uh, I have the term uh, the infodemic uh, in the title of the um, presentation. Um, the infodemic was launched as a concept from uh, WHO regarding the, the informational chaos, more or less, uh, in connection to the, uh, the pandemic that followed it almost immediately. And I've uh, fattened some of the important um, parts of the text here. Uh, an infodemic is too much information, including false or misleading information, uh, during this uh, outbreak. It causes confusion and risk-taking behaviors. 
uh, it also leads to mistrust in health authorities and undermines the public health response. And a little bit further down, with growing digitization and expansion of social media and internet use, uh, information can spread more rapidly. This can help to more quickly fill information voids, but can also amplify harmful messages. Uh, and there, there are a couple of mechanisms I would like to uh, focus on. Um, the infodemic and we as information actors, we people, we humans. Um, the pandemic is followed by a, a poor, unclear, difficult to interpret and fast moving state of knowledge and, and research. So there's a lot of um, information difficult to assess uh, in this situation. Uh, many people become uh, scared. There's fear, anxiety, insecurity, vulnerability, and after a while also political anger. Uh, all these strong emotions affect how we behave uh, when we search and uh, evaluate uh, information. Collective sense-making. Um, people seek, seek information and help on social media, uh, and they gather together to try to reason uh, around the about the topics uh, together. Uh, example, there are many, many uh, groups on the Corona topic uh, on Facebook. And here's a high risk of, of speculation and rumors, etc. because of the difficult uh, information um, uh, situation. Uh, and a number of actors, uh, many of them are serious, they gather around the same subjects and it becomes kind of a perfect storm. There, there are huge uh, data deficits or voids in these uh, discussions on social media uh, and there these uh, actors can enter and, and put out their um, uh, content and their narratives. At the same time, it's um, it's been a global information event, obviously. Uh, so a lot of, of content and rumors and statements and narratives, they spread quickly between countries and jump between languages. Uh, and there is so much uh, of, of this uh, dubious or difficult to assess uh, information. So it's impossible, at least in, in the smaller countries uh, like Sweden, to monitor and respond to all this um, uh, that's s spread around. So it's necessary to, to a large degree to use uh, international resources. The English language is uh, huge. There is so much uh, resources and uh, also good resources there. Uh, we have to learn to use this uh, as a, uh, as a pros rather than the cons. Um, two concepts, concepts that were mentioned in this VHO um, definition of infodemic was um, data deficit or void. A data deficit is, for example, now in the uh, pandemic, there's a great demand for credible information about the origin of the uh, pandemic, medical treatments, and later on about the public policy and so on. And as I mentioned, it's an unclear or fast moving uh, research and knowledge situation. It's very difficult often to assess different claims and the tendency to collective sense making, um, which I mentioned, speculation rumors. Uh, this puts a very great uh, demand on information providers, reporters, fact checkers, governments, health bodies, educational. Uh, um, institutions and so on to identify the deficits uh, and fill them with credible information. Uh, a data void is uh, an interesting concept that, that is um, good to reflect about. Um, uh, it, well, you can find it quite often uh, in the digital environments. Situations where few or no search results exist for uh, certain search terms. Uh, it often appears with new or unusual words, uh, phrases, and there's no established uh, definition yet. Uh, and this can be exploited by bad actors. They can, for example, coin new words or phrases, make them trend, create curiosity and lure traffic to their own alternative wor world. Uh, 
And this is a, a method of manipulation during, for example, uh, breaking news. Uh, probably it's more frequent in smaller uh, languages than in, for example, English. Um, and I have a couple of examples uh, just to illustrate. Here's one uh, in the autumn, early autumn of the a late summer of uh, 2019, there were suddenly, suddenly some rumors spread about Greta Thunberg and George Soros, uh, uh, the famous financial, former financial uh, businessman turned, uh, um, well, he has his, um, I haven't the words right now, but he's well known for his um, philanthropic uh, work. Uh, these rumors, uh, they entered the, uh, the social media in such a way that if you just made a search on those two words or names, Soros plus Greta, uh, you, from, from Google, you got this uh, as a, the, the top results. There were only hits in the alternative world, uh, often quite uh, highly politically um, loaded. Um, uh, and th they all supported this narrative of some kind of conspiracy uh, where Greta and, and uh, uh, George Soros were in co collusion uh, somehow. And there wasn't, there were no other information about this uh, at all. That's a perfect uh, example of, of data void. And here's another one that happened uh, one year later. Uh, suddenly uh, something about a, an Arabic party in Sweden uh, trended uh, on Twitter to, to the top trend. Uh, and if you Google it, you found only very strange um, alternative media and blogs and so on mentioning this party uh, at all. Uh, uh, and as it turned out, it was, it didn't exist. It was a one man party with a quite, uh, um, a not totally uh, sane person. Uh, but this was uh, discovered, he made a claim that he should burn the law books uh, from Sweden and some political uh, uh, forces in Sweden uh, found out about this and made it a news. Um, so if you Googled it, you came into this particular uh, world of alternative media and, uh, and bloggers and, and so on. Uh, if something like that happened, there are tools you can work with to more um, exactly find out who are spreading, diffusing, uh, diffu diffusing these, uh, these claims and, and these um, uh, words and so on social on social media. You, you can very quickly uh, make a uh, simple uh, spread on networks analysis, and this is something everyone can do uh, with some very simple tools. Uh, here is a tool. If you look at the picture uh, up to the right, you see a kind of spread um, graph of the tweets regarding this uh, Arabic party. Uh, it's a, it's a tool called hoax. You, I just printed in Arab, uh, Arabic party in Swedish and I could see after just a few seconds that there are, there were four accounts that pushed this narrative, uh, that day or those days and everybody else, uh, retweeted, uh, from these four. This is a very good way of seeing who is behind, uh, when something becomes trending for example for example or viral it's not always this clear uh, but more often than, than one believes you can see that there are a few uh, social forces or actors uh, behind uh, this kind of situations uh, here is something similar there's another tool uh, there's a simple plugin from uh, crowd tangle you can have in your uh, uh, reader on the computer and see where something is shared on Facebook, on Facebook pages and uh, uh, Facebook groups. Uh, here's um, an event page from Facebook uh, for a demonstration against the restrictions in Sweden uh, now um, May 1st, a few weeks ago, and against 
they don't mention that as much, but it's very much also against vaccines. It's uh, an anti-vax um, movement behind, not only, but they are very strong in this movement. And if I just search on who share, has shared this uh, event page, uh, you can see in the picture down to the right, a long list of Facebook groups and pages. Uh, it's there, uh, it was shared and you can quite quickly see which kind of networks uh, spread this information, who are mobilizing. Uh, and in this case, it was very uh, clear that it was very special networks. It's very much uh, an, uh, anti-vax, it's um, alternative medicine, it's uh, quite hardcore uh, far right wing uh, populism uh, and so on. Uh, this is something everybody could do, and it takes just a few seconds when you know how to do it and you have the plugin. Uh, we can jump this one, it's a similar example. Uh, here I go further into that you can see with small hints in the promotional material for this demonstration that there are strong anti-vax uh, tendencies in the material, but you have to go a little bit deeper and you have to use uh, uh, fact checks that you can find, perhaps not in your own language, but somewhere. In this case, it was a Norwegian fact check around a special uh, person. And here's something similar. Uh, there's a, a so-called movement right now against restrictions and vaccines. It's called World Freedom Alliance. It has a very strong presence in Sweden. Um, and here, here I do is a similar search, uh, an article published in an alternative site called Awake or Vaken in Swedish. It's a well-known old uh, site for alternative medicine and conspiracy theories. And they claim that they are, are uh, preparing to uh, put uh, the leading politicians in Sweden and in other countries uh, in, uh, in uh, court of justice because, because they, they, they believe or say that uh, the restriction and vaccine programs are against international law. And this is an idea, a narrative that's spreading far uh, right now around the world. Uh, and it's fact-checked many times already. It, it doesn't, international law doesn't apply at all in, in this situation. Uh, and I did a search and uh, again, where was this article shared? And there's a long row of Facebook groups and pages that illustrates uh, the networks uh, uh, around this. Something different, new research. It's also about the, uh, complicated information situation in the pandemic. Um, lots of research studies of varying, varying quality are produced. We were, to, we we're talking about tens of thousands of studies since last uh, winter about the virus, about uh, uh, medical uh, solutions and so on. Uh, and unfortunately more startling results get a lot of attention also in traditional news media. Uh, but you always have to ask yourself, do they reflect the state of the research? Um, and often news media, regardless whether they are the traditional more responsible ones or newer, less responsible ones, they often work with sensationalist headlines and they, perhaps the, the actual article is of better quality but behind a paywall. Um, and there are new forms of publication that makes all this more complicated. Uh, a lot of uh, research today is published before uh, it's actually published uh, and peer reviewed. So there are a lot of unreviewed uh, preprints uh, that you can find uh, in different uh, publishing stores and so on. And there are so called predatory journals who are uh, un not serious uh, journals with some kind of scientific claim. Uh, and there are of course outright misinformation and dis disinformation. And all this is easily accessible. It's free and it's uh, easy to spread uh, digitally. Uh, often becomes viral and difficult to put in context uh, for the average user. While serious studies as well as uh, qualitative science journalism uh, is behind a paywall. Uh, paywall. So this is, um, <laughs> quite problematic for the average user to uh, to navigate uh, 
between. And then you have all these individual researchers that debate on social media or on YouTube and so on. How should the average user interpret whether this person is part of a natural scientific conversation or is uh, a kind of dissenting voice? And this is very much utilized uh, uh, by different actors, for example, the anti-vaccine movement. Uh, so here you, you can see that science literacy, uh, some kind of fun foundational knowledge about how science looks and how it works is a factor uh, in media information literacy. Uh, but there are other issues too. You, you could, for example, uh, demand that uh, preprints should be um, labeled uh, clearer uh, about their, their status in the scientific process and, and so on. Uh, but overall, this has been a situation when the individual is forced to harbor uh, uncertainty. Uh, science does not always have quick, easy answers, but many uh, bad actors offers uh, that kind of uh, answers. Um, we can take this briefly. Uh, how should you assess or evaluate news media as a news consumer? Uh, the new situation is that you, in your feed or when you search or anything, you meet often uh, hundreds of media sites that are quite often, uh, often are quite difficult to evaluate. Uh, if we go back 30 years, we had uh, paper magazines, we had uh, Eater uh, Media, and most of us had an accustomed acquired knowledge of which sources had some quality. Uh, you had some kind of a map over uh, the landscape of important news, news media, but there weren't so many. Now it's a, it's a completely different uh, situation. And we also had, uh, for example, in Sweden, we had something called a press ethics system that uh, pointed out which media were uh, followed some uh, principles in journalism and so on. Um, and this ethics system is also, is also widening and alternative media is entering. Uh, the stage and make everything uh, more complicated. Uh, how should the uh, media consumer uh, act? Um, there are new ways of sorting out what is qualitative news and less qualitative news. Here's just an example. Junk news is a concept elaborated by Oxford Internet Institute that um, points out that certain types of so-called news media are actually a form of propaganda. Uh, they often use conspiracy theories, they are uh, working strongly with attention grabbing techniques and so on. It's, a, it's an example of, of these um, concepts. Another one is uh, counter media. It's from a quite recent Finnish research project. Uh, they point out that some of what we earlier called fake news or alternative media they are in a process of uh, prof professionalization. They become, they look better, they have journalists, they don't always uh, need to lie anymore. It's more about uh, identity building uh, than information. And they're often um, uh, uh, constructing some kind of a counter world. It's counter to what they point out as an establishment. Uh, they have very strong angles and biases in what they choose uh, to be uh, uh, news. They are often trying to move the boundaries of language uh, considered acceptable and so on. And uh, they very often work towards this identity building, a sense of belonging uh, among their uh, group of readers or watchers, uh, uh, often using polarization and creating internal enemy Im images and so on. Um, this is a way of trying to categorize these, these new types of, of uh, actors in the media stage. I have a few examples of resources you could use when you try to, um, uh, because often you meet international sources, even if, for example, in Sweden, if you go to social media, you often find uh, uh, English uh, language sites, uh, not least American. Uh, and how should we find information about what these sites are? And there are different resources help, uh, to help with that. Here's an example, uh, a media landscape chart from uh, an American company called Advantis, where they map different 
uh, new sites in degree of uh, trust, uh, trustworthiness, and if there are strong or less strong political bias uh, in them. Uh, there's a fine service called Media Bias Fact Check, who evaluate. They have thousands of uh, uh, media that they have these posts uh, about with evaluations. Here is an evaluation of um, uh, Epoch Times, an international uh, quite problematic uh, publication. They have both uh, paper magazines and uh, sites in, in, in many languages. It's an obviously a kind of a propaganda uh, organization with much problematic material. And you find this information quickly uh, and the evaluations are often well done um, and quite transparently uh, in method. There's another actor, this is a, a pay service a news guard. They do even greater, deeper analysis of each uh, news media the, the, they analyze. And they also have around four or 5,000 different media with these um, um, uh, evaluations. Um, and also English Wikipedia, you should not uh, underrate. Uh, uh, they have more and more articles about media uh, with these kind of evaluations. Uh, and they're often also quite well uh, made uh, these days. And these, this type of articles, especially when it regards more uh, problematic media, uh, they lock, uh, they protect the articles so not everyone can go in and, and uh, change them. Um, so this is a, an extended confirmed protected article about Epoch Times with about this, uh, it's about the same um, evaluation as the other, other ones I mentioned. So this is a resource, uh, kind of resource that I think uh, uh, people should be aware of. Um, I have a few uh, pictures here about the infodemic thematically. I, I, we, we, I think we can jump them. It's more about the different um, topics that's been most popular. Um, but I think every, everyone ha has a hunch about wh which topics has been the most uh, frequent. It, it's about where the virus comes from, uh, possible cures, uh, and of course, uh, perhaps conspiracies behind the virus and and uh, the, the policy responses and about the uh, vaccines and so on. And now they are coming quite a few in different languages, good reports and guides in how these conspiracy theories has been uh, constructed, the overarching themes of them. And uh, some of them have, this is one in Swedish that came just a few weeks ago with a good it's a good mapping of the conspiracy landscape regarding the pandemic, but also with the good uh, tips about how you should act, uh, respond, for example, to someone who, who spreads uh, conspiracy theories. So I think uh, we, we have uh, discovered perhaps some kind of uh, need for conspiracy theory literacy with some, some resources easily accessible for uh, uh, the public. Uh, a couple of posts showing just that conspiracy theories has been very frequent um, and uh, the, the mixture of different kind of uh, um, misinformation uh, in the infodemic. One important thing to remember, which all these pictures point to, is that there are some super spreaders. Uh, people on social media share a lot of things. But the amount of misinformation and disinformation would have been much less if these super spreaders uh, didn't exist. For example, Trump, uh, during his presidential years, he was the top super spreader of disinformation uh, regarding politics in, in the USA. And nowadays we have perhaps 20, uh, there are uh, a dozen, 12 anti-vax uh, influencers, you could call them. Who, is responsible, who are responsible for up to 65% of all anti-vaccine content. And it's a lot, I can say, uh, on social media. Uh, and in these kind of situations, you can discuss whether maybe you should deplatform these few people to reduce 
uh, this kind of storm of uh, disinformation. Um, one question is maybe you shouldn't always focus on uh, misinformation, specific misinformation regarding, for example, vaccines. Uh, maybe you should more focus, as I mentioned before, on the narratives and the networks. Who is spreading this and why? Uh, because they uh, often um, construct so many different narratives, but they are always um, very often the same. Here's a good quote from uh, Mike Caulfield. Many types of mis misinformation and conspiracy theories, not least during the infodemic, are extremely predictable and function almost like memes. It's the same old pieces of the puzzle, the same narrative, that are reused, some, some bits are taken away and some new uh, taken in. And they're probably better dealt with by pointing to these, the narratives, and to which actors are behind, than putting time and effort into, into examining each new specific statement. But my question is then, where can the citizen find uh, the presentation of these narratives or at all be aware of, of this uh, problem. Um, I've just, uh, I'm going to round up now. Um, one thing that's been, became, become very obvious is this I mentioned before that there are, there's evolved a lot of uh, international resources you could use uh, in this kind of situations. Uh, we have, for example, the genre of fact checks. There are uh, many fact checkers around the world, and they have collab collaborated with uh, uh, um, uh, with their own uh, database or, or with all fact checks of Corona vaccine claims from 2020 and, and this year. Uh, that's easily used. You can find fact checks about almost anything that's been claimed about uh, the virus and so on. And there are uh, scientists reviewing uh, health and medical claims in health feedback. There are uh, databases of reviews of climate claims. And Wikipedia has several very good uh, long articles where they uh, sort up many of uh, um, the claims uh, uh, on these topics. And there's an international network uh, of scientists, scholars in Europe that uh, produce um, guides and so on regarding conspiracy theories uh, that has come the last year. And maybe I should finish with, I here's the database. Uh, I recommend it. You can search for Bill Gates and suddenly you have uh, uh, 200 hits uh, with checks on claims about Bill Gates regard, uh, in connection to the uh, pandemic and vaccines. Google's Fact Check Explorer, Yes, Wikipedia's article COVID-19 misinformation with many uh, under uh, topics. And I should, I can stop here with mentioning that the Wikipedia is a very interesting resource we should uh, discuss more as a tool uh, and a help uh, in these issues. Uh, partly because it's so much used. The large platforms uh, as Facebook and Twitter and so on, YouTube, they are increasingly uh, themselves leaning towards Wikipedia as a reference. So it's, it's, it's more, important, more important than ever that Wikipedia actually has quality. Uh, and Wikipedia has stepped up, uh, especially the English Wikipedia. It's increasingly, uh, increasingly collaborating with knowledge institutions. In 2020, they started to work with WHO in connection with the pandemic. And there are some topics uh, in English Wikipedia, in particular uh, medicine, that are carefully monitored and edited by experts. Uh, and in some subjects, articles are produced at universities, so they can use the articles as course literature. And uh, there are nowadays projects where librarians worldwide monitor and complete references in, in uh, Wikipedia articles. Uh, and as I showed with uh, the example of Epoch Times, uh, Wikipedia has more and more depth, in-depth articles with assessments of news media. And I hope this is something that evolves in other languages uh, as well. And there are schools in some countries, in Sweden not least, that are increasingly using Wikipedia actively in their teaching. Uh, students get to learn the edit editing rules, they write themselves, they practice fact-checking in the process and so on. So something I would rec think is important is um, that Wikipedia literacy also should be discussed more 
uh, not all wick periodicals are good, but many of them are. How to evaluate that, how to assess that. And there are good learning resources about that also uh, in English. Uh, I believe I have, no, I didn't have that. Um, but I could, I can stop with, I we can jump that one and have this quote in the end. Um, there is so many uh, challenges here. Uh, and of course, much of this I've discussed and presented, it's, it's a matter of how to present this to the individual and uh, increase the capabilities and the um, knowledge, literacies and so on. But somewhere there's a, a, a borderline to when we have to deal with it as a, 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 a social uh, problem, a societal problem. We can't put all these. Um, uh, all these responsibilities on, on the individuals. Uh, there's a risk that we are blaming, as Sonia Livingstone here says, uh, responsibili responsibilizing the individual uh, leads eventually, as in the last fattened part of the text, uh, the politics of media literacy risks not only burdening, but also blame the individual for the problems of the digital environment, which is a societal uh, problem. Uh, so there, there I can. Stop. I can take down the share. Ah, uh, yeah. Stop share. Now stopped. <laughs>